which means they sometimes interfere with each other. Um, we're going to try and um, not have that happen as much as we can, but if it does get um, unbearable to you, just let us know in the chat or unmute yourself and we can try and rethink um, what's going on there. I think that's it for now. I'm going to hand over to Susan and Alison to introduce the session and then, and then we'll allow time for you to introduce yourselves. Um, Alison. Oh, Alison, you're on, you're on mute. There we go. It's like, um, it's a window, isn't it? Hi, how's that? Can you hear me? Hello, how nice of you all to join us. Thank you so much. It's lovely to see some of you coming back from last time. And thank you so much for all the work you sent in after the last session. Susan and I were absolutely thrilled to bits to, to see what you'd created and all the different directions it went in. So we're really looking forward to this, um, this session. So we're going to um, have loosely a similar sort of format. We'll have a little bit of time to say hello to each other and then a sort of quick 10 minutes to look through art history at how other artists have approached this topic. And Susan's going to explain a bit about 18th century letters and a format that we're going to explore today. Yes, hello everyone. It has been just wonderful seeing the things that people who were with us last time have sent through. So thanks very much for that. Um, if you get a glimpse of wonderful colour behind me, this is the sheet that Alison's prepared that we're going to be scribing on for this session. Uh, so the more contributions, the better. Um, we'll talk through some of that as we go along this morning. But um, if there are things that you want to add into the chat box as we go along, that would be lovely. Um, I have brought not an original, but um, very like an 18th century letter that we'll be having a look at in a moment or so after the introductions and after Alison's uh, images. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Susan. So I'm going to um, invite you to join a breakout room now just to introduce yourselves. There'll be sort of two, three or four of you in that room. Um, so just introduce yourselves to whoever's in that room and maybe share with them what um, what it is you've brought along with you today, your thing, so your letter or card or image. Um, we'll just do that for uh, five minutes and then um, we'll come back to the main session to get going. Welcome back everyone. I think we have a um, full house back with us. So um, if Alison is ready, I will hand over to her. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear anything. Could you put the speaker oh. on? Can you hear me, Alison? Hi, Sam. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's an echo. Could button. you run the PowerPoint presentation for us and I'll just talk us through that. So I thought what we might do is just have a wee look for 10 minutes or so at images from across art history. So I've put together a little PowerPoint entitled The Rainbow and the Journey. So forgive me if I'm a bit clunky on titles. I'm doing this on a phone and I can't actually read the uh, type very well. So, um, But hopefully you can see on a bigger screen than I've got. So my first one, if you move it on one, Sam, that would be great. Here we go, Albrecht Dürer. So Melancholia 1. This is an engraving from 1513, as you can see. So Albrecht Dürer was a famous um, artist from the German Renaissance. So I've chosen this. If you can see on the screen, he's chosen to depict melancholia as a winged figure. Some people would perhaps say a fallen angel, but anyway, whatever she is, look at her face. She is in the depths of despair, desperately sad person looking out into the distance. And he's chosen a rainbow in the background in this instance to symbolize hope. So I would say that she can't even see the rainbow because of the state of affairs that she's in. So this is an image that's got 
well, it's had art history questioning it for about 500 years. No one's entirely quite sure as to what some of the symbolism means in here, but perhaps you can see in the middle a really strange shape, a sort of polyhedron of some kind. Uh, nobody's quite sure what that's all about. But one thing is certain, it kind of adds to this sense of kind of confusion and heaviness and chaos. And what that's doing is it sends your eye off in all different directions. So compositionally, it's very clever. Um, anyway, let's move on to the next to the next slide. So this, we're le leaping through the centuries here. We've, we've come on to Turner. So 1798 is when this painting of Vladimir was exhibited. Now he would have um, he would have made it from a sketch that he had made in his tour of the lakes the year before, which was becoming a very popular thing to do in those days. So Turner is a sort of great painter of the Renaissance of the Romantic era. Um, so Romanticism was really all about a sort of painting an emotional response to landscape, um, and one of the key concepts of that was to paint the sublime, which is what he's done here. So the idea of the sublime was this thought that nature's awe-inspiring and these great big powerful elemental happenings, you know, big storms and waves and huge claps of thunder is where it was at. So you can see this is a, a great example of him using a mixture of, on the one hand, he has carefully observed the shape of the mountains, but then he's really heightened the dramatic light and he's put a rainbow in there purely and simply for sublime effect. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see there's little figures in a, in a rowing boat. So this whole idea of tiny people in a vast landscape. So let's move on to the next one. So similar period of time, this is from 1776. So Joseph Farrington. Now you can tell by the title, General View of Skidder and Derwent Water from Brandlehow Woods, 10th of September, 1776. So make no mistake, this is a man illustrating the topography of a, of a very real view. Um, and he was doing that for a very specific reason. He was, he was in busy making illustrations of the whole tour of the Lake District. He's one of the first artists to do that. Um, so in the 1780s, it became popular to do a tour of the lakes. Um, and alongside that, there were sort of guidebooks sprang up and this whole idea of the picturesque. So I've put this in partly because it's a, also a really good example of a picturesque painting. So that whole idea of the picturesque is something that became very popular in the 1780s. And there were lots of rules all about how you would make a painting picturesque. So, I mean, the rules to us nowadays are a bit crazy. They're very um, prescriptive. So, you know, you had to frame your view, preferably with trees, and you had to have a, a foreground. You can see it here, slightly elevated, and then you'd go through to a mid-ground and there'd be a far distance. And he even, um, so Reverend Gilpin was the man that came up with these rules that became very popular. Um, and he went into great detail about how you should bunch the rocks in threes or fives. And it was all to do with sort of composing a view and making it look aesthetically pleasing to the eye. A bit crazy to us nowadays, but in actual fact, you'd be surprised how much of that um, remains with us, sort of almost in our uh, collective subconscious in a way. I think we do still tend to shape views that way a little bit. And certainly a landscape gardener would tell you that gardeners will choose to plant things in threes and fives, which is a definite thing left over from the picturesque. Anyway, let's move on. We're going to we're going to rattle through these quite quickly. So our next our next one is a painting by John Constable. I couldn't miss this out because look at that rainbow. It's amazing. So this is actually a really unusual painting for Constable. Um, it's quite unusual for him to paint something that's not meteorologically sort of accurate and this is definitely an unusual piece for him he made lots of studies of the sky and um, of rainbows all of them precise and accurate but this is not one of them so when this was exhibited in 1831 um it's fairly clear that the rainbow actually wasn't there and he painted the rainbow perhaps a year or so later and there's a bit of speculation around this but it's quite possible that he's painted the rainbow in as a sort of tribute to his friend John Fisher. Um, so John Fisher was the Archdeacon of Salisbury Cathedral and the rainbow lands in the place where his house used to be. So 
it's not an unreasonable assumption that he's perhaps using the rainbow for sublime effect, but also perhaps as a tribute to a friend and possibly that idea of it being a bridge between heaven and earth. Could we move on to our next one? Okay, so now we've leapt through to contemporary art. So this is by Richard Long, a line made by walking, made in 1967, when he was still a student actually, I think he was quite young. So what he did was he walked up and down in a field in Wiltshire until he flattened the grass until he got this line and he photographed the line. So the amazing thing about that is that it occurred to him that sculpture could in fact be the trace of the movement that's been left behind by someone. And so this was the start of a whole way of thinking differently about what sculpture and what art might be. Um, so he's famous for what we would now class as land art. So he tends to make sculpture that will be made with natural materials always. So often with stones, often they'll take the form of a circle or a line. Uh, he also makes what he calls um, mud works, which are like big paintings made with slurpy mud with his hands. And he makes text pieces. Um, again, all of, all of these text pieces are recording the walks or journeys that he's made. So very often he might um, draw a line on a map and then walk that line. So could you move us on to the next one, Sam? So here we go. This is one of his text pieces, White Light Walk. I'll just read this. Red leaves of a Japanese maple, orange sun at four miles, yellow parsnips at 23 miles, green river slime at 45 miles, blue eyes of a child at 56 miles, indigo juice of a blackberry at 69 miles, violet wild cyclamen at 72 miles. So that's a piece he made in 1987. Um, and he's made a lot of similar text pieces where he beautifully records a journey and amalgamates that with his thinking. So I'm going to read you a little quote, what he says about his own work. He says, my footsteps make the mark, my legs carry me across the country. It's like a way of measuring the world. I love that connection to my own body. It's me to the world. Walking brings time and space into my art. Space meaning distance. A work of art can be a journey. Okay, let's move on to our next one. So this is, um, so I don't know if you can see it, but there's two images here. Hopefully you can see them both. The image on the right is an image of a hand, hand scroll, a Chinese hand scroll, uh, before it's unwrapped. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through this particular hand scroll. So this, this hand scroll is called Dwelling in the Fujian Mountains. It's a famous Chinese hand scroll, and it was made between 1347 and 1350 um, by a famous artist called Huang Gongwang. So it's 20 feet, 22 feet long in total. Um, it's actually now in two parts, which is a shame, and it wouldn't have been originally. The picture I've put in on the right there is not, not actually the same scroll, but I put that in because I just wanted you to be aware that the way you look at a hand scroll is really part of the experience. So. I'm going to take you through this hand scroll. We've got several images of it. Because it's so long and thin, you can't really get it on one image. So the way a Chinese hand scroll works is that it's not depicting a real place exactly. It's more about a journey of the mind. And so it takes its cue from things that may have been seen, but it's really all about the expression of the way it's painted and the meditative journey that it takes you on. So the way, the way it works is you would view as hand scroll um, on a table. They, they each have a wooden box usually carved that they're kept in. And then you'd lift the lid. Inside the lid, you would find a beautiful piece of silk. You would unfold the silk and inside the silk, you find a lovely scroll that's got a silken cord wrapped around it with a little toggle, usually made of jade or ivory. And everything about this process, the fact it takes you quite some time to unfold it, is very deliberate. That's to slow you down and to focus your attention. So having opened it, what you do then is you hold it in your left hand and you open it out to the right, um, about a shoulder's width apart. And you look through the whole scroll in this way. So you unfold it in sections. So this first bit is the opening section of this scroll. 
So I'm afraid I can't read Chinese, so I can't tell you what those characters say, but generally they would be a poem or an introduction to the scroll. Um, so if you, do you mind just scrolling us through these as we go, Sam? The first one here, you can see where we've got quite a detailed look of a big mountain. And then if you look at the top scroll, that's the next section. So that section there, you can see our viewpoint has changed. We've we're much lower and we've come right down to the shore and you can see hopefully the variety of marks and language of lines that he's using in the ink is extraordinary so you can see as well big empty space that opens right out and the idea with these scrolls is that as you the process and your eye literally reads them almost like a piece of text so you you start to really get drawn in, usually from very dense um, dense marks, it'll then lead you inwards and out to a more sparse area. So you can see that happening here in the top image. So quite a wide open expanse, which has that feeling that you get when you look out to sea, perhaps, you know, a really infinite space. And then the image underneath would be the next section, more or less, as you unroll the scroll. So you can see in that next section, the um, marks he's using are quite different. He's using slightly different um, brushes and he's using different techniques. He's really got into the textures, it's extraordinary. I think you could probably look at that for hours, to be honest, but he's also done this brilliant thing that they can do in a Chinese scroll, which is he's lifted your viewpoint up. So you could be a bird flying upwards or you could be halfway up a mountain. Suddenly you're much elevated and you can see right to the distance, you can see how he's drifted in faint shapes of mountains at the back and then can you move us on again Sam and then as you move on there you go the top image is the next bit so he then brings you back down so your viewpoint is back down to the shore now and it looks to me like the wind's picked up and he's using a much drier brush um, and the marks are very much uh, they're very expressive but they've got that feel of wind I think and then he's beautifully put in tiny tiny details of paths and bridges and you can see almost the, every spine on the trees you know it's extraordinary the level of detail and then the image below is the next section that you'd pull out again and you can see how it's opening back out into a big expanse and you're low down now and then this last image is of a, a mountain again not dissimilar to the shape that we began with at the start so I suppose it's almost a bit cinematic the way these open out and they do have a sort of a way of uh, inspiring meditative thought partly because they take you on this journey that's really quite personal so it's just you in the room making actual physical contact with with the work of art you're looking at and you'll see as well can you roll us on another one i'm not sure if we've got one more perhaps oh no okay you'll see as well if you go back sam sorry you'll see that you might have noticed the red seal marks on some of these images. That Those seals are put on by different people who've owned the scroll or who've read the scroll and perhaps um, written a poem on top. So it's very much a dialogue between the here and now and the people who own it and read it and the person who created it. So quite kind of participatory in its own way. Okay, let's move us on. So we're gonna whiz through now to Olafur Eliasson who is a contemporary Danish stroke Icelandic artist. So he's Icelandic, but has lived most of his life in Denmark. So he had an exhibition last year at Tate Modern, um, and he's famous really for making big sculptures and large installations. Um, so he's interested in natural phenomena and using natural elements, and his installations make you become aware of your own senses. So his hope is that by becoming more aware of your own senses, you also become more aware of the people around you and of the world beyond. So the picture on the left is colour wheel, colour mirror wheel made in 2019. That's made of hand blown mirrors uh, and it's a three dimensional ring. Um, and it, it shows all the spectrum of visible light. And then the, the one on the right there is called beauty. Um, and that's an installation. It's very simple, really. It's a white spotlight uh, that shines through a fine mist of water vapour. And so when you walk into the room, the light comes on and 
you get a spectrum of colour appearing, which will be generated slightly differently for each person. It'll be different according to where you stand. Um, so you can literally feel yourself seeing. That's the idea. Okay, could you move us on one more? Thank you. So we have two paintings here by Winifred Nicholson. So um, this one from 1923, Cyclamen and Primula, was painted in Switzerland. Uh, and I think Winifred Nicholson is a person that was fascinated by colour, by how it, by how she could portray, particularly flowers, but I think she probably saw colours. I think she saw a spectrum of colour that other people can't see, to be honest. So I'm going to read you her words about um, this picture. So she made several pictures, all from this particular windowsill. Uh, so she says this. Ben gave me a pot of lilies of the valley, Mugetti, in a tissue paper wrapper. This I stood on the windowsill. Behind was the azure blue, mountain, lake, sky, all there. And the tissue paper wrapper held the secret of the universe. The picture painted itself. And after that, the same theme painted itself on that windowsill. In a cyclamen, primula or cinnabaria, sunlight on leaves and sunlight shining transparent through a lens, through the mystery of tissue paper. So that gives you some idea of how she sees things. Um, could you skip us on to the next one, Sam? So this one, toward, this is painted towards the end of her life. And she made quite a lot of paintings in the last few years of her life using a prism. And this is one of them. Um, so this is what she said about using a prism. She said that when she looked through a prism, she knew what flowers know. She knows how to divide the colors in longer and shorter wavelengths and in so doing give the luminosity and brilliance of pure colour in the ordered sequence of the octave of colour. So that phrase, the octave of colour, I think is really interesting. Um, partly because there's an assumption, I suppose we're so used to the idea that a rainbow has seven colours, which goes back to Isaac Newton and his experiments back in the 1600s. Um, but in actual fact, when he put white light through a prism, um, he chose to write down seven colours because he liked the analogy of that fitting with musical notes. Um, it's not because he only saw seven colours, it's a whole spectrum. You can see as many colours as you want. And I think when if Fred Nicholson understood that, um, if you don't mind Sam. Oh, where's she gone? Sam, could you move this on? Yeah, Alison, is there one more slide? Hopefully, we just missed that. More um, we just missed that last sentence. Your internet cut out. I can't it. hear what she's saying. Could you put the speaker? Yeah, please. Uh, Alison, that, last, oh, that last sentence that you said. Um, your internet just dropped. So if you just repeat that last sentence for this picture. Sorry. Um, so I was just saying that I think Winifred Nicholson could see a whole range of colour that potentially other people can't see and that in the spectrum of the rainbow there are as many colours as you want to see, not just the seven that Isaac Newton gave us. Um, and then I was asking you if there's one more slide that we could move on to. Here we go, this is our last one. So this is called Colour and it's by Angelica Kaufman, painted 1778 to 80. So this was a commission for the Royal Academy and it's still there. If you go to the Royal Academy in London, you'll see it and the entrance hall in the roof above you. She was commissioned to paint four elements of art is what she called them. All of them round, roundels for the, for the ceiling. And it was Joshua Reynolds that commissioned her to do these. So this one, colour, she's chosen to represent colour as a female artist. And if you look carefully, you can see her palette is empty with just a little speck of white on it. And she's literally drawing down the colours of the rainbow from heaven. So I think that's a really nice um, idea and one that I, I think I'm going to leave us there for now. I'll be coming over to you now, Susan. They were gorgeous images and uh, the reading from Richard Long was wonderful as well, Alison. Thank you. Um, so much to think about. I kept jotting down ideas and if people are doing the same, uh, we might be able to weave those into our scribing for the uh, later on in the session. Um, but that idea that Winif Winif Winifred Nicholson knew what flowers knew through light, I think is just gorgeous. 
Um, there is a little bit of Dorothy Wordsworth's journals that I thought I would read. Um, and then I was going to talk a little bit more about the Wordsworths and journeying and how we might weave in some of our own feelings about the journeys we make, whether they're the physical, geographical ones or the emotional ones. Um, but just to bring the two themes together um, in a very short piece from Dorothy Wordsworth's writings from summer in 1800. Um, she says, the evening excessively beautiful, a rich reflection of the moon, the moonlight clouds and the hills, and from the rays gap, a huge rainbow pillar. We sailed upon the lake till it was 10 o'clock. And I love that because when you see it written down, she spells rays, which is Dunmill rays, towards uh, Keswick. She spells it R-A-Y-S and gives it a capital letter. But that idea of there being a huge rainbow pillar against a moonlight sky, I think is just gorgeous. She also talks somewhere about walking. She loves to night walk and she gets a bit vexed um, from time to time if neighbours from the, the hamlet or the village uh, fall into step alongside her sometimes. You can tell that she wants to enjoy that experience very much on her on her own really, um, or in the company of her brother and uh, friend Coleridge. At one point a moon bowl, and the description of the moon bowl was something that really stuck with me because um, I remember seeing one uh, walking along the Solway one night just from Port Carlisle to Bonus, and it is the most extraordinary sight from that, that sphere um, makes you feel very, um, very special to be able to see it, I think. Um, Dorothy Wordsworth's journals obviously record much of her life and the journeys that she and her brother have made to get to sharing Dove Cottage in Grasmere, which she feels is the happiest time of her life. Um, it was a very precarious one for them, really. Um, and some of that, I think, is reflected in her writing because just before she and her brother set off for France, uh, a couple of years later in the summer of 1802. Um, she knows it's going to be a very um, significant journey um, emotionally. Um, and she uh, will be coming back to the Gosler letter shortly, but I'm, I'm just thinking that before they set off for France, um, she bids a very uh, quite a high high emotional, highly emotional uh, farewell to Dove Cottage because she knows that when they come back, Wordsworth is going to marry Mary Hutchinson, the life that they've built there together is going to change significantly. And you can see that in the writing, she, she writes with lots of dashes and even exclamation marks, which she doesn't use so very often. Um, she says, uh, they go out into the garden and they see glow worms, but not so numerous. This is on the eve of setting off for their travels, which will end up in France. Um, where her brother will break with um, Anne Vallon, uh, and Annette Vallon and meet his daughter for the first time. So it's a very supercharged time. She says, Dear Mary William, the horses come Friday morning, so I must give over. William is eating his broth. I must prepare to go. The swallows, I must leave them. The well, the garden, the roses all. Dear creatures, they sang last night after I was in bed, seemed to be singing to one another just before they settled to rest for the night. Well, I must go farewell. And what I love is that the next morning when they actually set off, it's very matter of fact. Uh, 9th of July, William and I set forward to Keswick on our road to Gallow Hill. We had a pleasant ride, but the day was showery. So I think you see sort of an, a, an emotional sort of journey going on, even in the, the style of the writing. She is a wonderful travel writer. And the description of the journey that they make um, to or they leave um, the North Country uh, all the way south and then across to Calais for this really very emotional um, meeting with Annette and Carolyn. Uh, it's all recorded um, up until the point where you would imagine you would get that resurgence of emotion. And then she doesn't really... Um, but on the way, she's given you the most wonderful descriptions of, of places. And if anyone here is a friend of Hull, uh, I'm very sorry, she's incredibly rude about Hull, which she describes as a terrible, dark, uh, brick housey, dirty place. Personally, I, I love Hull. Um, but she writes very well when traveling. And I think that idea of combining writing and, and imagination when we're in movement is a very sort of um, familiar one, perhaps. If I try and keep a diary, I can't. But if I'm traveling, I do keep a journal. And I think that's maybe common to some uh, to some of us um she 
writes a wonderful tour of uh, recollection of a tour of Scotland that she makes with her brother and Coleridge uh, in 1803 and we'll come back to that later in the session but for now if, if Sam you can show us the Gosler letter um, I'll talk a little bit about their time in Germany so we're going to be folding paper we're going to have a sort of demonstration of how these letters were folded and um, but for now i thought it might be fun to just look at this facsimile of what we i don't know if people can see what i'm holding up to the screen as well if i do that and um, this little letter tiny little thing um it's not the real thing don't panic um it's a good facsimile of what's known in our collection at grasmere as the gosler letter and it's precious in so very many ways. Um, you'll see that it's sealed or was sealed before it was received. And you'll see if you can read it, uh, even if you can't read the words, there's very little writing on the address panel. And I think this is just extraordinary. Um, this was a shared letter that was written by both William and Dorothy Wordsworth to their friend Coleridge. The three of them had gone to Germany together. They'd separated. Uh, William and Dorothy were in lodgings in uh, Gosler, so it's known as the Gosler letter, whereas uh, their friend Coleridge, to whom they're writing here, uh, was having a gay old time in Ratzeburg, a university town a few hundred miles away. Um, and the contrast between their experiences of Germany just um, wonderful, really. Um, but we had a session with a conservator, a conservationist, Victoria Stevens, who showed us um, a, a manuscript. And as she unfolded it, you could hear, I don't know if you can, the absolute crackle of um, that experience of opening a letter, imagining the thrill of it, but also she was saying in museum and collection terms how exciting it is for people to get up close to that and to have that sense of the sound and the feel of things. Um, so just as you can see on the shared screen there, um, that's one side of this amazing letter. Um, you'll see that there are two lots of handwriting going on in it. Um, are we able to see the, the Gosler letter both sides, Sam? There's a second side to it as well. Yeah. Uh, the writing is going in every direction. Um, Dorothy and William, particularly Dorothy Wordsworth, is writing about the very poor experience she feels that they're having in, in Germany. Worst winter um, in, a, in a century. Uh, they're in quite miserable lodgings. Um, it's a bit like TripAdvisor. Uh, they, they don't think that the locals like them. And uh, I think <laughs> they, they struggled um, in trying to learn German. Um, but this letter is just a treasure house. It's full of Dorothy writing about the sort of experience they're having and her brother, um, and I think this is very telling, starting to write not just um, some of his finest short poems, but beginning to write um, his big um, biographical, autobiographical poem, The Prelude. So this little letter from the winter of 1798-1799 um, has got the beginnings of The Prelude, um, a poem which isn't published until after Wordsworth dies um, in 1850. Um, but it has its roots in this sense, I think, of homesickness and dislocation that they're experiencing on their travels. Um, they share the writing of the letter. You can see how, how intimate and how, um, just how sort of collaborative the relationship between the two of them is. And the writing is going in every direction. They're trying to use every single scrap of it because paper's precious. But also there are crossings out and there are blots and there are little sort of markings to show you where to read next. And I think, if nothing else, um, it's a wonderful encouragement to people, maybe not setting off on a 8,000 line life poem, um, but thinking that when we're painting or drawing, drawing or when we're starting to write um, things don't have to be perfect they all begin in different places so this is a lovely sort of seed letter and if um, Sam you could just move on to that third image of a uh, letter from Dorothy Wordsworth if we can see this is just lovely 
Um, this is a letter that's written um, from the safety and refuge of Dove Cottage by Dorothy Wordsworth to her friend Lady Beaumont. They know they're going to have to move on. William and Mary's family's growing and they're going to have to make another journey. Um, and they go in a fairly roundabout way, which fairly eventually means they end up at Bridal. But I love this letter because she draws a little house. And it's just how I would draw a little house. And she's telling how many children would I think. And she's telling um, her friend that they've been so happy at Dove Cottage. Um, and I just think it's very revealing that um, she knows that life's going to make another big change, just as it did when she and her brother set off to France eight, six, seven, eight years earlier. Um, there's no door on this little house. I think she's really quite keen to stay and to have things stay the same, really. We're going to see a little film which will show us um, just how to fold um, one of these letters. And I think Alison will also have things to say about how we might then use our own folded sheets and the little compartments that are made by the folds within it um, to record journeys, um, whether they're real or imagined or uh, vividly in our memories. But we thought that as well as combining um, drawing, painting, colour perhaps, but also using inks if we have them, um, it would be lovely to start adding in some words as well of our own. And we thought that having looked at haiku last time, we might sort of consider writing couplets this time. Um, they're very familiar. Um, if you know a poem, the chances are you know a poem that is written in couplets. Um, got a memory for poetry, I fail on that score. Um, but essentially a couplet is a unit that is used in so many poems from all sorts of different periods. Um, but it, it, it's really just two consecutive lines uh, that rhyme and they most likely have a similar length if you are to look at them on similar rhythm, a shared rhythm. Um, and there are a few examples. Um, from the poem that we sent around after last time's session, the beginning of that beautiful words with poem, calm is the fragrant air and loath to lose, dazed great for warmth, though moist with falling dews. Look for the stars, you'll say that there are none. Look up for a second time and one by one you mark them twinkling out with silvery light and wonder how they could elude the sight. So that's the opening of a poem um, and it's written in rhyming cup couplets and it gives it a sort of flow and an ease and a tranquility that I think is reflected in the poem itself. Um, John Clare, uh, another uh, later romantic poet who wrote about the natural world, beautiful little couplet from his progressive rhyme, for everything I felt a love, the weeds below, the birds above. And just in case people are thinking that maybe Dorothy Wordsworth um, didn't write poetry, but wrote wonderful, I have seen in the chat box that people are saying she wrote wonderful prose. Um, she, she wrote quite a few poems, although she claimed that she wasn't a poet. But one begins, what way does the wind come? What way does he go? He rides over the water and over the snow. And again, it's a very simple, deceptively simple, I think, uh, rhyming couplet, um, which she's writing at the beginning of a poem, which is written to calm down her niece and nephew, um, who are scared of the winter gales in the Lake District. Um, and she writes this wonderful, boisterous poem in response to cheer them. So we will have a look um, at um, Jeff from Dove Cottage, showing us how to fold a letter. Um, if you can be thinking, as he does, about maybe three words that just spring to mind when we think about rainbows, um, and another three that are prompted by that whole idea of journeys, whether those are the real physical journeys or the more emotional, imaginative journeys that, that we make. Um, and if you can be jotting those down after um, we've all folded our papers, um, following Jeff's lead, um, we'll... Uh, feedback on those words and start to scribe things up on this wonderful rainbow sheet behind me. So thanks for now, that's lovely. So this is a, um, a, an exercise in folding a sheet of paper and turning a sheet of paper into a letter with its own envelope. And because it was complete, with the letter and the envelope together, these were called entires. 
Um, and if you do it today and you post it, uh, we have uh, evidence, as it were, that, that they will get to the other end. So it's a method that still works. So if you take your, your sheet of paper and you fold it um, that way, fold it uh, along its longest length, and the way to do that is to line your sheet of paper up against the shortest length, put your finger on the fore edge, and then with your other forefinger, draw it back to the fold. And when you've got it back to the fold, move it first in that direction, and then move it back in that direction. So you've got a very nice, clean fold. Um, that's, that's how it should look. What we then do, uh, making sure that's nice and tight, is we uh, hold it with the fold at the top, and about a third of the way in, doesn't have to be that exact, but about a third of the way in, fold it over and then draw another crease like that. So you end up with something like that. Yeah, so there's the there's the folded edge and you can see it's at 90 degrees. And then you take the other side and you fold that in uh, about a third again. And again, fold it down the crease so you end up with something that looks like that there's the fold and you can see that we've now got two pieces at 90 degrees yeah and then if we fold one that way and then that one that way um, if you fold both sides in you end up with something a third of the width of the shortest length yeah so do it again folded it in, we folded it in, and you end up with something like that. So what we're going to do now is get a third, is to fold it over a third at the top. So again, very, very roughly done, but something that looks like that. That wasn't a third, but you get the idea. Uh, so about a third like that. And then you do the same at the bottom. So we'll fold that one in about a third. So just like we did with the first set of folds, you end up with like a little bridge like that. So there's the third that we start. There's the where we started. We folded that in, and we folded that in, and you end up with a little packet like that. Now, if it works, you can then take one of these. Um, and fold it inside one of the other something like that and you can then put a wax seal on there or a piece of sellotape or something just to hold it in place so so there's your there's your Regency letter and if you can then take a pen and write the address on there something simple like that when you then open it out, you can see where the address panel should go on the big sheet. And the usual thing would be to have the address there and to begin your letter at the top of the opposite page. So something like that. So there's your address panel and there's your opening lines to your letter. So just to see it one more time, fold it up like that, fold it in like that, fold it across like that, like that, like that, and there's your Regency letter. That was great, Jeff. Uh, in his absence, we'll send him a vote of thanks for that. Um, I hope everyone managed. I could see in the chat box that some people were regretting not having thinner paper. Uh, I think there's a limit to how many times you can fold paper before you reach infinity. Um, I forgot to say when we saw the address um, panel there that when we were looking at the Gosler letter, the letter found Coleridge when it was sent by the Woolworths from Gosler, even though it was simply addressed to her Coleridge, Ratzburg. So it traveled across Germany to a named person in a town and it found him. 
um, which I think is extraordinary. People are putting some lovely letters, um, some words in as well. Um, I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to say, um, Alison, um, about the, the folding. So it strikes me now that we've hopefully all got a, a folded um, a folded letter like that. Oh. Hold on. Can you hear me? Probably not. We can hear you, Alison. Are you struggling with your phone? Yeah, sorry, here we go. No, Yay. Know, Hopefully fine. you can hear me now, I think. So it strikes me now that you've all got a neatly folded letter. I'm I'm one of those people whose paper is a bit thick, so I've got a really it's almost as, as deep as it is long. <laughs> and it strikes me that it might be worth marking in some way that panel so that you know which one is going to be the um you know, the address panel. So I'm just going to literally use a pencil to mark that panel up so that I know that that one is the one where I will be addressing it, if I'm addressing it. Um, so it struck, it struck us that having made this, there, there are one or two things to consider here. So as a format, this is quite an interesting uh, thing. So hopefully you've folded your paper and you will have ended up with lots of little squares or rectangles. Now, it would be nice to use that format. So at, in the same way that we were looking at Chinese scrolls and thinking about how the format of them being very long and thin and the nature of them unfolding slowly um, is a bit cinematic and it sort of gives you the option for different viewpoints and perspectives. So maybe the squares in our letter also give you options to use it in certain ways. So each little square could be seen as perhaps a, literally a view or a window if, if you're relating, if you're using this to chart a journey. Or you could look at them as little pockets for thoughts. Well, they could literally be like your pockets. You know how, I don't know if you're like me, you go for a walk and you end up with a load of stones and a random thing that you picked up and you could, you could compartmentalize your thinking and use each little square for a different thought. Or you could write the couplets that um, Susan was talking about earlier, or we could draw across them. So I'm gonna turn my phone down and show you a couple of things that you might want to do with ink that just might help with that process. But there's really no rules about this. You might like to write this as a letter to someone. You might like to write it as a letter to yourself to be read in future, um, perhaps your thoughts of this period of time. You might want to make it a journey. It could be one that you've done that's in your brain, or it could be one you haven't yet done that you'd love to do. You could use it in all manner of ways, and you could use it almost as a, a mapping or listing exercise for all the stuff you're about to do, or that you wish you'd done. Anyway, I'll show you a couple of things with ink, and then I think we should let you have a think about how you would like to use this particular format. Um, as I say, there's no rules about this. So I'm gonna turn my phone um, down to face paper, you'll have to tell me if you can see it. Can you see that? I can see it. Yeah. Is that okay? Can you see my hands? Yes. Okay. This is so weird because I can't see you, but anyway. So uh, what I've done is I've got some uh, black ink there, uh, which is, I'm actually using Indian ink, but it wouldn't matter if you were using Chinese ink or you could just use any ink you've got, quink would do, whatever you have. So I've got three pots you can see here. It's a bit alarming actually having pots of ink with, with uh, computery things all in one desk. Um, I've also got three brushes. Now, it doesn't matter if you haven't got three brushes at all. That's only so that I don't get them muddled up with my um, different strengths of ink. So the first one, um, hold on, I've also got a cloth that's deliberate so that we can do some things with dry brushes too. So I'm just going to show you a couple of things you might like to do. I think it doesn't mean at all that you have to. Um, so forgive me for not using my big folded piece of paper. That's because I have a, quite a small area to work in. So one thing you could do is uh, with the, so did I explain? I've got ink here that's not diluted at all. And then I've got one pot of ink, which is half ink and half water and another pot, which is half of that mixture with half water again. So we've got three dilutions going on. It uh, doesn't matter if that's not exact, by the way. So I'm gonna use a bit of the middle one, which is half diluted. 
And I'm just going to think about um, the idea of a view that I saw the other day. And I'm going to add extra water in. I'm going to use a, if you ever want to take things out, it's a bit like watercolour, you can use water as, as like almost like a rubber and you can dry your brush out and then you can take out the bits you don't want. You can also let ink do what, do what it's doing. So I'm going to hold this up so that you can see it. Hopefully you can see how the ink kind of runs and does its own thing. I like it when it does that. Not everyone does. You could make it very, um, well, like this. You could make it very flat and straight if you want to make a calm, still sort of mark. And I'd like you to think about the nature of the marks. If you think back to that Chinese scroll, think about the sheer variety of marks that, that were used in that. So marks have a direction and a pace. So this is just with a very dry brush. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can't. I will use a twig. Hold on, one of my favourite twigs. So you can... You can think of marks as having a direction. And you know how we were talking about how the Goslar letter is divided up into sections and it's written in all different directions. So somebody's written this way, somebody's written thoughts over here and somebody's added in bits here. You, the effect of that visually, if you weren't trying to read it, is that it's quite exciting. There's lots of little bits everywhere and you could use your squares that way if you wanted to. Uh, one more thing I quickly show you that I quite like doing is to use something like this, like a bit of cardboard. Um, so if you wanted to make a direction of travel, if you like, around your piece of paper, it'd be nice to guide your thoughts around it. You can use things like this. It could be anything. It could be a bit of wood or it could be a rag, um, but you'll get very different marks. So you can use those in whatever way you like. So there's no right and wrong here. Explore, see what marks you can make. And you'll find every artist has their own sort of language of marks, I suppose you could call it. And I personally think you'll see with these, I'll hold that up. Can you see how the darker end, uh, there's a weight to marks. So these are definitely going that way. Um, and this is definitely going this way. That's not just because I know it, because I drew, drew it, it actually is. So push it that way and you've made those marks go the other way. Equally, drop water on, see what happens. Just have fun with it. There is no right and wrong. One more thing you might want to do is dropping ink in and letting it, letting it find its own way. And then you also might like to take bits out. So do you remember the big empty space in the, in the scrolls? Don't be scared of leaving empty bits. And having got your lovely folded uh, paper, I would suggest it might be nice to do a mixture of writing and drawing. Think about how you write the words as well. Uh, and one more thing that might be appropriate for people who've got um, felt tips and maybe not got ink. Um, you could do it still with those. Let's have a quick look. Um, so if you've got... Um, if you've just got felt tips, you might find that you want to draw, I don't know, on your journey, you might've come across a significant tree. Fine to use felt tips and play around with them. And then fine as well to do this, and wash it over with a bit of water, which will do that, which is, quite interesting too. So that is purely and simply because felt tips are not waterproof. Whereas if I wash over this bit here, which is red ink that I used the other day, um, Indian ink is waterproof. So you'll find you can wash over that. If you see what I mean. So here's a piece 
of lots and splots from the other day. It occurred to me as well on your squares, you might like to make shapes that you repeat and you'll find that your eye is drawn to make a connection. So I've used these blobs a bit like milestones and they could become part of the journey if you wanted them to. And you will find when your ink is completely dry, you can wash over it and you'll still, you'll still be able to see. So I'm going to leave it there and let you play around. Please come back to me with any questions and please don't be at all scared of trying everything. I tend to think that if it all goes a bit wrong and it's not what you thought, that's just the beginning of some brilliant new idea that you've not yet discovered. And try dry, dry brush techniques and dry marks like that. So Dorothy's lovely phrase about the wind strikes me that you can make the wind appear when you make marks like that. So have a go. It would be lovely if you spend a bit of time thinking about how you use this format. Now I'm going to shut up and let you get on with it for a while. <laughs> So we've got about 15 minutes, I think, to do our own thing. Um, I'm getting some lovely messages through the chat box and I'm adding them already onto the sheet. So if you want to carry on doing that, that's great. But otherwise we'll bring things together in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes after we've finished this quiet time. Enjoy it.
You're muted, Susan. Yeah, if you see um, Susan speaking, it's probably that she's speaking to Alison in the studio rather than wanting to speak in, into the space. <laughs>
Hi everyone. Um, it doesn't feel like the time's gone by. It's gone very fast, but I've not captured all the wonderful things that are appearing in the chat box. But um, we can do a bit of sharing now, reading up things that we've already got onto Alison's rainbow sheet. Um, but if there are any sort of observations that people want to make about what they're doing, how it's going, um, throw them into the mix as well. So, I keep getting distracted by the chat box because it's, it's just <laughs> full of so many great things. <laughs> Oh, there might be work that people want to show to the screen as well, um, but I could start us coming back together by perhaps just reading through some of the things that are on the sheet so that you get a sense of the other things that people have been saying. So we have, you won't be able to see it terribly well, um, thankfully it blurs perhaps my writing. So uh, we've got magical, we've got before, between, again, Hope, intensity, light intensity, between. What true love, sign from lost love, rain come shine, you're always mine. Enjoy both, <laughs> I can't read my writing, rain and sun, I will wait for you to come. A sheet of paper, blank I find. We have light several times in different ways. We have light, we have outer, inner, and distance, iridescent. You only see things when you move. Escape, tears, darkness emergence, the jumbled thoughts all tangled there. We have color, we have joy, we have life, we have sparkle, we have trust, we have illuminated, we have gold, we have transitory, we have rainbow serenity and purpose, anticipation, Rainbow footsteps sampling every colour of life's journey. We have memory and natural phenomena. We have colour. We have illuminated. And we have an observation that um, the Richard Long that um, Alison shared with us, white light walk. Someone's pointed out that that's the chakra colours. And it's also, um, if you see it on the page, less obvious when you hear it read, um, it is an acrostic poem. So the first letter of every line spells out the word rainbow, but it's beautifully hidden, I think, in those images and distances. Um, if there'd been time, I was going to read from Dorothy Wordsworth's itinerary for the travels that uh, she and Wordsworth and Coleridge made in Scotland in 1803, where she just lists the places and the states of the road. You'll be pleased to know if you're anything like local to the fells, that the road at Hesket Newmarket was terribly bad. <laughs> That was back in 1803. <laughs> so um, are there things that people would like to add in? We've got other things appearing, Hope, Dove, Noah and his ark. Um, the things that we've not been able to capture on the sheet, um, Sam kindly saved the chat box um, from last session. So if uh, you don't mind doing the same again this time, Sam, we'll um, make sure that everything gets put onto the, um, the sheet for however we end up saving. Um, everything is a record, whether it's a collage or scrolling. I was just going to say, um, we will, at the end of the three sessions, we will end up with three of these large um, backdrops that we've been describing on, and we will make some, some kind of uh, collaged artwork. We might uh, rip them up and cut them up and reshape them into something that's woven together as a record of our collective thoughts over these three sessions. So it'd be lovely if you do send stuff through, that would be really wonderful and we can print it out or incorporate it because I'm quite aware you might need time after the session to really do this and it's going to take some thinking as well. So it, it'd be lovely if you if you could send those through to us, that'd be great. Thank you. Would anybody like to share anything? If there's time for anybody who wants to hold up any work to show us, that would be really lovely. Um, and then um, I think we probably are running out of time. But like last time, we're hoping that this will have inspired 
all of us to go on and create other things in the meantime. I see something there, Penny. That's looking lovely. So, were you using? That, that was um, the smudgy things are felt tips with water. Mm. This was acrylic pen. Wow. <laughs> Just a mix of things. <laughs> so you've travelled across that piece of paper. Definitely. <laughs> Bit Thanks. more than I've travelled in the last three months, I think. <laughs> yes, there is a sort of um, bittersweetness about the fact that we've asked you all to go on some journeys. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in that. <laughs> uh, anything else from anyone else? I think Christine is sharing something, Susan. I'll go on to speak of you, sorry. Let's see. I've just gone... Oh into the sort of map modes because um, I have actually been doing some work over with, with a college course around uh, tapestries and maps and it's just been quite nice to have the freedom of doing it with ink and water and just yeah it's just a sort of repetitive view of what I do <laughs> every day with the <laughs> The colours are beautiful. Race, actually. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. It's so nice to see. I love, I love how you've been quite flowy with the ink. You know, you've really kind of gone with the flow, which I think is lovely. Yeah. I can tell that you need to fold that paper out and keep going until it's <laughs> covering your whole table. Yeah. Yeah. And Louise, you said in the chat box you're happy to share. Would you like to unmute yourself? If you can hear me. So yes. whilst, you, whilst you were talking, I wrote a couple of two-line poems. Lovely. And I had to go doing some little sort of drawings with them. So I can, I can read them out. I don't know whether you can see. So this one says, oh dear the house, the mess we make, it's time to pen, paint and plant and bake. <laughs> this one says, um, uh, I don't know whether you can see that. A, a time to heal, a time to grow, to imagine all the places will go. Oh, Louise, lovely. This, and this one says, some days it's bad, we're cross, we shout, we need some space, we want to go out. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you've turned uh, quiet desperation into something lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louise. That's okay. I'll mute myself. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, I see Polly's Polly's got something there. So um <laughs> hi. Um I I wrote uh started writing a poem and then I kind of inked over it. Um <laughs> because I was um, I don't know if you can see it all there. It's kind of dripping mm. down the bottom. Um, uh, because I, I realised as you were all uh, talking before that um, last night I, I had a dream um, that I was in a place which is a real place, um, which is kind of what the picture is of. Um, but I have a dream version of it that is not not the real place, which I keep visiting. Um, which I do a lot in my dreams. I, I visit places which are very much, you know, uh, I'll say like they're um, a particular place in my dream. And in my dream, I know that that place and I'll go back to them and they're definitely that place. Um, but they're not the real place at all. Mm. Yes. Um, so um, I wrote it, yeah. kind of wrote about that a bit and then um, painted over it, inked over it. I like... Holly, I completely love the, the idea of inking over the poem <laughs> and the way the words kind of go into the ink, seep into yeah, it, it's beautiful. Yeah, really and the dribbly bits, just lovely. You've got to keep the dribbly bits. Disappeared That's beautiful. It. Isn't that interesting how it's somehow all the more dreamy for having bits that are 
um, a bit watery. Mm. I think that's yeah. really lovely. Mm. And it's it's all like it's it's all to do with the sea as well. What I was dreaming about was 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 the sea really. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, hopefully Polly and everyone else will be able to send us images or text from the things that they've written, but to, to have those lovely combinations of images and words is just gorgeous. Um, so we'll look forward to, to seeing those. Yeah, like I did with the um, previous sessions, um, I will put together all of the um, writing that's gone in the chat box and any images that you send in. Last time I made a little gallery out of them and, and sent them back to you so that we can share what other people have done. Um, so I'll do that again. So you'll get an email from me over the next few days with the video from today, an edited version of it. Um, then people's work that whoever sent stuff in to us along with the chat box and any links that Susan and Alison want to share with you for um, further reading or um, yeah, yeah, artwork. Um, so I will do that in the next few days. Um, I shared in the, the chat box um, the survey from today. That would really help Alison and Susan and ourselves to, um, to kind of uh, look at what's worked well today and in any of the sessions that if you've been in the last one as well to keep um, making those uh, work well for you. And I earlier shared the link to the next session, which is called the Cabinet of Curiosities. Um, I've just um, sent it in the chat box again there. Um, that's on Tuesday, the 14th of July, same time, 10.30 till 12, um, if you wanted, to, if you're interested in joining us on that one. I don't know if Susan or Alison, you just want to say a word or two about the next session, or is it too curious? Susan, you're, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, yes, it, it, it's really going to be an adventure for all of us, I think. Um, there is a real cabinet of curiosities. I'm sure there are many, actually. Uh, so we will be looking at that. It's from the collection at uh, Dove Cottage, um, and it belonged to another writer, Robert Southey. Um, but I think our idea, Alison, for next time is that people will bring along something that they would like to put in a cabinet of curiosities, what they would like to find there. Um, and obviously, it can be a real physical object. It can be something tangible, or it could be, you know, a concept. Personally, I'm hoping to put the night sky in it, so uh, it'll need to be fairly large. Um, but really, just let our imaginations run, I think. How about you, Alison? Is there anything else? Susan and I are, are both compiling a personal list of our own cabinet of curiosities, which we've not yet shared with each other. Mine, I can tell you, is becoming quite outrageous. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing what's in Susan's. And we will be, again, we'll be compiling, we'll be putting together painting alongside words. And I think it's fair to say our first session was quite painty and our second session has been more wordy and our third session should be a 50-50. So I look forward to seeing you then.